Transformation to an eco-effective vision does not happen at once, and it requires plenty of trial and error, time, effort, money, and creativity extended in many directions. In this final chapter of the Cradle to Cradle book, we will be looking at 5 steps to put eco-effectiveness into practice. Step 1. Get free of known culprit. A move towards eco-effectiveness means we have to say no to the substances that are widely recognized as harmful. In our daily life, we are so used to hearing products advertised as phosphate-free, lead-free, and fragrance-free. But it is important to acknowledge the potential state of the approach and the less visible problems it may conceal. The substance may be phosphate-free, but have they been replaced by something worse? Simply, being free of one does not necessarily make a product healthy and safe. Moreover, the package could contain other harmful substances such as harmful coating or heavy metals in the ink used to print on it. It is possible that the manufacturer increased sales and saved money and effort by simply announcing that the packaging was culprit free. But these culprits could get mixed in the food product itself, which can be very costly for both the manufacturers and the consumers. Additionally, some substances are known to be bioaccumulative, and getting free of them is always a productive and crucial step. Some substances belong to what we call X list, and they include materials such as PVC, cadmium, lead, and mercury. More information about this list comes at step 3. For now, talking about known culprits, the decision to create products that are free of harmful substances is the fundamental of what we call a design filter, which is fairly crude, equivalent to the decision not to include any items that might be harmful to human and environment. Step 2. Follow informed personal preferences. Imagine someone is designing the green offices and they have to use some not clearly specified ingredients from the manufacturer. In this case, they have to ask the manufacturers about the ingredients. If they don't get the clear answer, they have to make choices based on their limited amount of information. This means the materials they use might not be completely green and as a result, it can have some lasting effects. We are standing in the middle of an enormous marketplace filled with largely undefined ingredients and it makes everyone's life difficult. Sometimes we may find ourselves choosing between a petrochemical based fabric and all natural cotton that was produced with the help of large amounts of petrochemically generated nitrogen fertilizers and strip mined radioactive phosphates, not to mention insecticides and herbicides. But in the meantime, there are three ways we can follow to make better choices. Preferring ecological intelligence. Be as sure as you can that a product or substance does not contain substances and support practices that are harmful to human and environmental health. When working on a building, for example, the architects might prefer to use sustainably harvested wood. Even in the case if they have not seen the particular forest where they are harvesting and they don't know how deep their commitment to sustainability goes. But if they decide to go with the product based on what they know best at the given time, the results would probably be better than had they not thought about the issue at all. In general, we should prefer products that can be taken back to the manufacturer and disassembled for reuse in technical production. If we want chemical products, we should choose the one with fewer additives, especially stabilizer and antioxidants. Preferring respect. The issue of respect is at the heart of eco-effective design, and although it is a difficult quality to quantify, it is manifested on several different levels, such as by respecting those who make the product, the communities near where it is made, those who handle and transport it, and ultimately the customer who use it. People's reasons for making choices in the marketplace are not rational and can easily be manipulated. For example, people like the idea of buying something that makes them feel special and smart, and they stay away from the products that make them feel unintelligent. We are wise to beware of our motivations when choosing materials, and we also can look for the materials whose advertising matches the inside, again, as indicative of a broader commitment to the issues that concern us. Preferring delight, celebration, 
and fun. Another element we can attempt to assess, and perhaps the most readily apparent, is pleasure or delight. Ecologically intelligent products need to be at the front front of human expression. They can express the best of design creativity, adding pleasure and delight to life. Certainly, they can accomplish more than simply making the customer feel guilty or bad in some way while immediate decisions are being made. Step 3. Creating a passive positive list. This is the point at which design begins to become fully eco-effective. Going beyond existing, we conduct a detailed inventory of the entire materials used in a given product and the substances it may give off in the course of its manufacture and use. The questions we ask here are, are they toxic, maybe carcinogenic, how is the product used and what is its end state, what are the effects on the local and global communities. Once screened, substances are placed on the following list that assign greater or less urgency to problematic substances. The X list. This is the list of the most problematic ones. Those are teratogenic, mutagenic, carcinogenic or harmful in direct and indirect ways to humans and the environment. Some example materials are asbestos, benzene, vinyl chloride, antimony trioxide and chromium. Substances placed on the X list are considered the highest priorities for the complete phase out and if necessary and possible replacement. The grey list. Now this is not so urgent list. The list includes problematic substances that are essential for manufacture and for which we currently have no viable substitutes. Cadmium, for example, is highly toxic. But for the time being, it continues to be used in the production of photovoltaic solar collectors. If these are made and marketed as products of service, with the manufacturer retaining ownership of the cadmium molecules as a technical nutrient, we might even consider this an appropriate, safe use of the material at least until we can rethink the design of solar collectors more profoundly. The P list. This is our positive or preferred list that includes substances actively defined as healthy and safe for use. Some checklists we consider are acute oral or inhalation toxicity, chronic toxicity, is the substance a strong sensitizer, is the substance a known or suspected carcinogen or mutagen disruptor, water or soil toxicity, etc. For example, a manufacturer of polyester fabric, having discovered that the blue dye it is using is mutagenic and carcinogenic, might choose another safe blue dye. We improve the existing product in increments, changing what we can without fundamentally preconceiving the product. We look as wide and deeply as we can at what it is and ask if the problematic substitute is coming from the material or around the machinery used to make it. Step 4. Activate the positive list. Here is where redesign begins in earnest, where we stop trying to be less bad and start figuring out how to be good. Now we set out with eco-effective principles so that the product is designed from the beginning to end to become food for either biological or technical metabolisms. For example, if we are working with an automobile manufacturer, at this point, we have learned all that we can about the car as it is. We know what it is made of and how the materials were put together. If we are choosing new materials, for example, for the brake pads or rubber for the tires, we have to think about how they can enter biological and technical cycles safely. We have to use biodegradable paints and design the car for disassembly so that they still plastic and other technical nutrients can once again be available to industry. Step 5. Reinvent. In this final step, we are doing more than designing for biological and technical cycles. We are recasting the design assignment. This means, if we are designing a car, we don't just design a car, but design a new tree vehicle. Instead of aiming to create cars with minimal or zero negative emissions, Imagine cars designed to release positive emissions and generate other nutritious effects on the environment. Everything the car emits is nutritious for nature or industries. As it burns fuel, the water vapor in its emissions could be captured and turned back into the water. 
Using fluid mechanics, tires could be designed to attract and capture harmful particles, hence cleaning the air instead of further polluting it. And of course, after the end of its useful life, all the car's materials go back to biological or technical cycle. It is all about pushing the design assignment further. Most transportation infrastructures spoil and devolve valuable natural land that could be used for housing and agriculture. Conventional development also depletes the quality of life with traffic noise, exhaust, and ugliness. A new tree vehicle introduces a new approach to highways. They could be covered over, providing new green space for housing, agriculture, or recreation. This final step has no absolute endpoint, and the results may be an entirely different kind of product than the one you begin to work on. But it will be an evolution of the product in the sense that it addresses the limitations you became aware of as you moved through the previous steps. When we optimize our design, we open our imaginations to new possibilities. We ask, what is the customer's need? How is the culture evolving? And how can these purposes be met by appealing and different kind of products and services? Thank you for listening. With this video, we have now finished the Cradle to Cradle book.